Hey everyone. Um, so I thought I had already had a video lecture for this material, but I don't. Well, not um, not all of it together in the way that I want to do it now. So uh, this is going to be the video lecture. It's going to cover setting conflict and how to write dialogue. Hopefully, um, I'm hoping to get it all done in one uh, one video lecture. So the first thing about st about setting. Um, when it comes to creative writing, um, is that within a story, setting can play multiple functions. And it's important to understand those functions and how you can use that to your effect. So the first thing is, uh, first function of setting is setting as the world. You see this both in classic and modern, in modern literature, where, um, where the world is, um, the setting is, uh, emblematic of the world. Um, so, like, the Lord of the Rings movies, um, Star Wars even, um, a lot of fiction and films out there, the setting is meant to be a metaphor for the world. Um, even in, um, Underworld, a novel by Don DeLillo, that setting itself acts like um, acts as a metaphor for the larger world. Um, setting as mood or symbol, this one's really easy. Just about anything written by Poe or King or any horror movie, where the setting itself um, helps to establish the mood and the symbolism within the story. Okay, like perfect example: The Fall of the House of Usher by Poe. The House of Usher as a setting is crucially important for the mood and the mood and tone of the story. Setting is action. Think of any novel or film about war where the setting itself is the action. All right. Setting is character. Um, this one's really fun to play with. Uh, the great Gatsby is a good example where, um, the actual setting of, you know, Long Island in the 1920s, and that sort of cultural period within that geographic location acts like a character in how it influences the characters to do things or to seek out things. Um, a good modern example, let me think for a second. I'm back. Um, what is this? Um, I was trying to think of another example of setting as character and was trying to find my notes for the lecture, but couldn't find them. Um, setting as character. So basically this is when the char the setting behaves almost like a character in influencing, um, influencing the story. Okay. Um, setting as conflict. You see this often. Um, it's not necessarily the same as action. Setting as conflict is in that the setting itself helps create the conflict. So Moby Dick, Jaws, um, there's a hundred of other examples, but um, this is where the setting helps to create some of the conflict, okay? Conflict. Now, um, conflict is not necessarily bad. All stories have conflict of some kind, even love stories. Um, conflict is, a sense, is in an essence what pushes the narrative forward and what forces the characters to change. It is not necessarily bad, like I said. It can be bad, but it can be in, there can be internal conflict. There could be conflict between two characters, protagonist, antagonist, what we're used to. Um, but conflict can also be happy, like a love story. There's conflict because uh, these two people are falling in love and blah, 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 needs to happen for them to be together. Mm -hmm. um, it also helps create the momentum within the actual story. Um, so conflict, where does conflict come from? It comes from characters and setting, usually. Conflict is usually interpersonal or it can come from the setting. Um, if you think of um, like a war movie, some of the conflict comes from the actual setting of soldiers being in war. Um, conflict in fiction is crucially important. It's the driving force. Um, conflict 
in creative nonfiction is usually a very personal conflict. It's very, it's usually uh, more of an internal conflict. It can be, still can be conflict between two different people if you're writing a personal essay, um, but everything has conflict in some form or the other. Sorry, I need to just pause again. Effective beginnings and endings. We have to have effective beginnings and endings or the, or the uh, reader's gonna feel cheated. I think I've mentioned this before, it's kind of random, but I always start all of my projects with the first sentence. Once I know what the first sentence is and I know where the story's going, I write the last sentence. I guess I shouldn't say I always do that, but most times I do that. And then for me in my head, even if it's a novel, it's helpful for me to think of the story as being connecting those two sentences. But um, we have to have an effective beginning. It has to hook the reader. Um, it uh, must be vivid and interesting. Um, we need to gain the reader's interest, and then we need to maintain it. And you don't want the reader to feel cheated at the end. So your hook or inciting incident needs to happen right away. And especially in short stories, it needs to happen right away. Um, I judge, uh, I haven't done it this year, but for years I judged a first novel writing contest where the winner, um, the winner won publication and $10,000. And we gave them um, ideally two pages, at most five pages, for um, the hook to be there for us to know the characters, the conflict, to know what was happening. So all for the inciting incident to happen, all of that stuff needs to happen right away. So think two to five pages in a novel, in a short story, or a personal essay, anything like that, it needs to happen right away. Um, and then resolution, you don't want to leave your readers feeling cheated at the end. It doesn't have to be completely tied up in a nice bow, but they need to feel um, satisfied. Um, and going back to conflict for a second, um, one of my professors in grad school once told me, he said that think of conflict as you put your main character in a tree, and that you throw rocks at him and you wait and see when he happens. That's what conflict is. Um, and for the endings, they need to be, um, they need to, there's no real rule for endings. Um, they need to be satisfactory to the reader. You need to tie up plot holes and stuff like that. Generally, you're told that your characters have to change by the end. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, there's a great short story that we're not going to read this semester where our characters, it's two characters, and they both almost change, and then they revert back to who they were before. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot that needs to be thought about when it comes to um, the resolution to the ending. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, even very simple, very short flash fiction has a beginning, middle, and end. Um, the shortest short published short story is this. Let's see if you can see that. For Sale, Baby Shoes, Never Worn. This was written by Hemingway. But as simple as this is, it does have a beginning, middle, and end. The beginning, For Sale, Baby Shoes, Middle, Never Worn, The Ending. And that leaves us with some sort of question of what happened. You know, why are the baby shoes for sale that were never worn? That type of thing. Okay. Now... I'm going to read you just the beginning of chapter one of Fight Club, um, just so you can see how much conflict, the setting, the characters, all of that is established. What I'm actually going to read you is about one, like about one, one and a half pages, all right? Tyler gets me a job as a waiter. After that, Tyler's pushing a gun in my mouth and saying the first step to eternal life is you have to die. 
For a long time, though, Tyler and I were best friends. People are always asking, did I know about Tyler Durden? The barrel of the gun pressed against the back of my throat, Tyler says, we, w we really won't die. With my tongue, I can feel the silencer holes we drilled into the barrel of the gun. Most of the noise a gunshot makes is, is expanding gases, and there's the tiny sonic boom a bullet makes because it travels so fast. To make a silencer, you just drill holes in the barrel of the gun, a lot of holes. This lets the gas escape and slows the bullet down to below the speed of sound. You drill the holes wrong and the gun will blow off your hand. This isn't really death, Tyler says. We'll be, le we'll be legend. We won't grow old. I tongue the barrel into my cheek and say, Tyler, you're thinking of vampires. The building we're standing on won't be here in 10 minutes. You take a 98% concentration of fumic nitric acid and add the acid to three times that amount of sulfuric acid. Do this in an ice bath. Then add glycerin drop by drop with an eyedropper. You have nitroglycerin. I know this because Tyler knows this. <clears throat> mix the nitro with the sawdust and you have a nice plastic explosive. A lot of folks mix their nitro with cotton and add Epsom salt as a, a sulfate. This works too. Some folks, they use paraffin mixed with nitro. Paraffin has never, ever worked for me. So Tyler and I are on top of the Parker Morris building with the gun stuck in my mouth and we hear glass breaking. Look over the edge. It's a cloudy day, even this high up. This is the world's tallest building, and, th and this high up, the wind is always cold. It's so quiet this high up, the feeling you get is that you're one of those sp space monkeys. You do, you do the little job you're trained to do, pull a lever, push a button. You don't understand any of it, then you just die. 190 floors, 91 floors up, you look over the edge of the roof, and the street below is mottled with a shag carpet of people standing, looking up. The breaking glass is a window right below us. A window blows out the side of the building and then comes a file cabinet big as a black refrigerator. Right below us, a six drawer filing cabinet drops right, right out off the cliff face of the building and drops turning slowly and drops getting smaller and drops disappearing into the packed crowd. Somewhere in the 191 floors underneath us, the space monkeys and the mischief committee of Project Mayhem are running wild, destroying every scrap of history. That old saying, how you all... How you always kill the one you love? Well, look, it works both ways. With a gun stuck in your mouth and the barrel of the gun between your teeth, you can only you can only talk in vowels. We're uh, we're now down to to our last ten minutes. Okay, so I'm actually going to pause this recording here because um, we're almost out of time, and then there'll be a second part where I talk about this briefly, and then uh, there's one last other thing that we need to talk about.